Philip has just lost the respect of the youth league football team he coaches. He was asked what New England should do in the draft, and his answer was objectively terrible. The Athletic just wrote a great article about this, but Philip doesn't have the Athletic or the respect of a boisterous group of 11-year-olds who once looked up to him. Learn from Philip's error. Get the Athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Rineker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. What's up, Browns fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Dogs Podcast. Not live today uh, because we are recording, uh, coming to you with an awesome interview we got lined up for you with DC Defenders Matt McCrane. Uh, he's kicked for the Browns before, been around the NFL. He's now kicking in the UFL. You guys don't want to miss this. Uh, so make sure you guys stay tuned. Check this out. Before we dive into the interview, though, uh, remember, if you want to get your intros, your voicemails on the show, head to thedogspodcast.com. Tap leave voicemail on the drop down menu. You can also find our merch store. Um, me and Josh did not call each other today. No, we did uh, not. <laughs> these are not these are not dogs podcast t shirts. But Josh and I still dressed alike. We didn't call each other. Um, <laughs> we saw each other when we got ready before we came. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we showed up and I was like, "Oh man, me and Josh are wearing the same shirt. This That's is so embarrassing." Cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the dogs podcast dot com uh, tap leave voicemail. You can also find the merch store. We got cool stuff in there. Um, Remember, if you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Make sure you tap the notification bell so you don't miss any of the new content we're putting out. We got a lot of cool stuff getting ready to come up. A um, lot of cool cool opportunities for the show coming up this offseason. You don't want to miss any of it. Uh, you can also uh, listen on Apple, Spotify, and Google, or find us on any of the major social media platforms. Just search at the Dogs Podcast. And lastly, if you're looking for more Dogs content, head to jointhedogs.com. Become an official Dog Pack member on our Patreon page. You get access to the private Discord. You get an extra episode every week, fantasy football with us. Uh, when we have guests on, like we do today, you we will let you get some questions in, so you get to ask questions to our special guests. You know, sometimes we have uh, guys kicking in the UFL. We've had Browns players before. So if you want a chance to get your question up to a, an NFL or a professional football player, make sure you join that dog pack, get it, get a chance to interact with the show. Sometimes you even get to come on the show, like guys like Kenny Mack, DF, that kind of stuff. So that's join the dogs.com become an official dog pack member. Uh, before we head into the interview, I do want to remind you guys about the official home of the dogs podcast, Kittles brick oven pub in green, Ohio, right off the Masson road exit. Go check it out. Uh, we're going to have a pizza on the menu, a beer on the menu. The food there is great. Uh, we actually just had somebody go in there and rep us, talk about us for the first time. Justin, I think got to talk to him. Ben from Hartville. I, uh, <laughs> I literally just got out of work. I was, uh, it was uh, looking super rough. <laughs> <laughs> it might shock you. Podcasting is not a full-time job for us. Uh, I work in a factory. So, uh, yeah, I got to talk to him for a few minutes. Super nice guy was there with his family. Um, just wanted to tell him, appreciate the support on both ends. But uh, we also wanted to shout them out. The yep. first ever. First ever. So if you if you go into Kittles right now, you mentioned you heard about them on the Dogs Podcast, you'll get a free appetizer uh, with the purchase of an entree. So make sure you guys mention us when you go there. Again, huge shout out to Ben. We appreciate you supporting the show, listening every week, and we appreciate you going, supporting our friends over at Kittles. Again, that's Kittles uh, Brick Oven Pub in Green, Ohio, right off the Masson Road exit. Go check them out. Mention the dog. Get yourself a free appetizer. We're super excited to be partnered with them and for them to be the official home of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, we are going to have a naming contest for our pizza and our beer. So listen up. If you want a chance to name the pizza and the beer, we will, we will make an official post. This video is the official post for YouTube. <laughs> we'll make an official post on Facebook and we will, we will make an official post on Twitter and we'll pin it. If you want to name the pizza and you want to name the beer, comment your idea for the name for the pizza and the beer, say pizza idea, whatever beer idea you leave as many as you'd like tell them what the pizza is yes the pizza is going to be a buffalo chicken pizza delish in the beer we, we are going to go up and taste a couple but i i would imagine based on all of our beer preferences it's going to be some sort of light lager light ipa kind of deal so uh think of if that 
helps you with your naming. Um, with, we are going to take all of your guys' suggestions and recommendations and ideas. We will come up with maybe our top four or five, and then we'll post polls out on all the socials and let you guys vote. And you guys will name the pizza and name the beer that will be named after us at Kittle's Brick Oven Pub. So I think it's a really cool idea, a uh, fun idea to get you guys involved. You, know, you guys know we love having you guys involved on the show. So drop your, drop your ideas on mm-hmm. Twitter, X, formerly known as Twitter, yeah. uh, Facebook, again, and on this video on YouTube. I would say the only rules is it's just got to be r- restaurant appropriate. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you don't have to be local, obviously. You can be anywhere in the country, in the world, listening to this. If you're like, hey, I got a great idea what your pizza should be called. Drop it in there, and the winner, uh, we're probably going to be sending, whoever gets whoever's name gets picked, we'll send you a Kittle slash Dogs t-shirt. Yep. We send you guys some some merch. So again, let us know your ideas. The more we get, the better options we have. Uh, the better the pool will be. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your guys' ideas. Again, it's going to be a buffalo chicken pizza and probably some light lager IPA that kind of deal. So uh, get your get your ideas in. Uh, we appreciate all the participation. So like I mentioned in the open, we're we're joined today with a very special guest, Matt McCrane. Uh, joins us kicking for the defenders in the UFL. He played at Kansas State. Uh, he is number two in the Big 12 Conference uh, in their history in field goal percentage, number seven in NCAA history in field goal percentage. Uh, he's made 86.4% of his kicks when he was in college, uh, played, spent some time in Cleveland. We're, man, we're very pumped to have you on here, taking time out of your day to join us here on the Dogs. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, as I mentioned to you before you uh, started the show, man, it's I enjoy being around uh, Midwestern people and uh, and especially Cleveland Browns fans. So I look forward to it. I'm uh, I'm really pumped to get your perspective on you were here in 2020. We talked a little bit before we, we started recording. I'm really interested in getting your perspective on like your time in Cleveland. And then I'm actually, I'm really interested in like how the UFL is comparing in terms to like NFL life. And I wanted to get into a little bit, maybe like in the mental side of kicking. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Cade York and the Browns and how they, they drafted him, let him go. And now he's back. So I think we got a lot of cool stuff to get into today. Um, one of the first things that we, we, we kind of talked about was in, in 2018, you kicked for the Cardinals after Phil Dawson, Dawson, uh, Obviously, he's a Cleveland legend. And we were just kind of curious, did you get to know him at all, your impression? Did he teach you anything about how to approach the game like as a pro? I mean, he's he's kind of an NFL legend, not just a Cleveland legend. Yeah, so, um, you know, of course, Phil being a Texas guy like myself, um, I think we kind of connected right off the bat. Um, but, man, I that was a, a long preseason I spent with Arizona, and then they brought me back and forth uh, many times while Phil was there. So it, it's funny, I when I was – competing, uh, I guess you could call it during that training camp with him. Um, and he told me this later on, he said, I, I wasn't giving you any insight. I wasn't giving you any help because I didn't want you to beat me out. <laughs> and so I think when, when he got injured, um, and they brought me back in, Phil started to kind of coach me up and, and give me some help on, on kicking the football. So I thought that was pretty cool and in, in front of him, even, uh, you know, where he was at in his career, he, he was still competitive. I, uh, so you, you kind of, you touched on, first of all, that's, that's, I got to meet Phil Dawson. A lot of people know this, and so did Josh. When we were in high school, we were actually on a TV show. Oh, that's right. And <laughs> Phil Dawson gave out the awards on this TV show for somebody in our community. So we got to meet him when we were like 13, 14 years old. Uh, so that was pretty cool. But you kind of touched on how they Arizona brought you back and forth a little bit. And I, I, I touched on Cade York already a little bit and tying it in with the Browns. And I, I, was, I was going through reading about you, learning a little bit, and I was just wanting to – what is the life of a professional kicker that people might not know you, you? I feel like you guys as kickers, we either don't hear about you or everybody's cussing you out. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, you know, you always Correct. hear that you have one job thing and, and it's like, yeah. and it's just, I can't I- imagine it's a fun uh, time. You either, you want to be either unnoticed or cause it seems like if you're being noticed, it's never for being, it's never a good thing unless your name's Justin Tucker or Adam Vinatieri, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? So right. just, yeah. What goes into that? Like, it seems like the job security and there's only one kicker on every team for the most part. Like, how do you stay yeah, up and, right. and stay positive? And cause you're, you, you're, you're making kicks, you know what I mean? You're making your kicks. And then, so right. just how do you stay right. in the right mental frame? Yeah. I think that's something that, that I learned early on was I had success, um, 
you know, early on in my college career and, and dealt with a little bit of injury in college, but then kind of picked right back up on it and had a good junior and senior season, which then ultimately got me into the National Football League. Um, but when I got to the NFL, you know, just as you mentioned, I mean, there's only 32 guys on a roster. And, and fortunately for me, early on in my NFL career, it was kind of during the heart of COVID. And so teams were carrying a practice squad guy, uh, often kind of two practice squad uh, specialists. And so that kind of opened my door to get on rosters. And so, you know, when you look at my resume of teams that I've been with, I would say there was really only one team that I had a genuine chance of, of having that spot. And that's when I was with the Raiders. Um, you know, I had missed a couple kicks off the dirt. I missed one when we played in, in London. And then they replaced him with Daniel Carlson, who's had a great career and, and is still there. And so the rest of them, it's always been, okay, this guy's been injured. Can you come in for a week? Um, you know, obviously COVID, like I mentioned. But yeah, the the mental struggle of being a professional, uh, not only a football player, but a kicker, is it's a cutthroat league, man. <laughs> I mean, you you hear it all the time of, you know, a kicker comes in, he has one bad game, he's cut, and another team picks him up, and he has a you know a stellar career after that. And so, finding out the differences of why you know you're successful with one team versus the other, and, and you see that with quarterbacks as well jumping around the league. And so, one thing that you know, looking back on is if I had a little bit more time and teams put a little bit more trust in uh, you know in their kickers, I think you can see them start to develop. Um, you know, again, Cade York, York example, I think AB made a good move by bringing him back because he's a, he's a solid kicker, you know? And, um, you know, I, I, I was watching your show early on, you talk about kicking in the elements. I mean, at what point do you, you know, do you expect to have a 90% kicker when he's kicking in Cleveland? You know, <laughs> a, Phil Dawson, a, a Phil Dawson comes around once in a lifetime, uh, the Adam Vinatieri's. Um, but when you look at success across the National Football League, they tend to be indoor kickers, unless you get an outlier like Justin Tucker. And so I think you have to figure out where you're good at, and are you a good indoor kicker or are you a good outdoor kicker? And I think teams have, have struggled sometimes finding that. So then in, in relating to that, would you – everybody – we always hear – we hear this with, like, quarterbacks too. All the quarterbacks can throw. You know, they all got, they all got NFL arms. All the kickers in the NFL, they can all kick. How much of the game right. is is between the ears? How much of it is mental? And if if you you hit a rough patch, maybe get cut a couple times. How hard is it yeah. to get it back? You know, like it, like Cape yeah. York. How how hard is it for him to come back in, refocus, and realize like, okay, I know I can kick at this level. I've done it before. I just got to relax and do it again. How hard is that? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I mean, to the everyday person, the viewer, you can allude it to uh, you know playing golf. Um, it's absolutely between the ears. You know, I, I was watching a full swing episode just the other day and you see guys that, you know, might make the cut or might not. And then the next week they're, they're winning the tournament. So what's the difference between that, um, you know, being successful and, and not being successful. And so you just, it, it's hard, man. I mean, I, whenever I was jumping in between teams when I was, like I said, with, with Phil Dawson back and forth with Arizona, I think, you know, three or four times is you go from having this NFL experience of being with the team nutritionist and being with strength and conditioning, you're at all these world-class facilities. And then the next day you're cut and I'm back at home working, you know, my restaurant and, and serving tacos out the window to, <laughs> to customers. And so I think it's, uh, it, it's tough, man. And you have to be mentally tough to handle that, especially if for some reason you happen to miss a, a crucial kick, you just got to rebound and know that, Hey, I deserve to be here. Yeah, that's the mental side of just anything in professional sports, really anything in life, but, you know, sports and like we're talking about here with kicking and all that. But one thing that you did just mention that I wanted to make sure I ask you about, you mentioned AB, you thought he did the right thing, a good move by bringing K York back. What was your experience with Andrew Barry? Yeah. So again, do, because I was there in COVID year, um, I really didn't get a spend uh, because of the proximity sensors and all those things sure. that we had to wear. I didn't get to spend a lot of time um, with management or, or ownership, but I did get to know AB um, uh, pretty well enough to where we stay in contact even to this day. Um, and, you know, he's a Harvard grad. He's an analytics guy. And I think he's trying to create, from my experience with him, we're trying to create, or Cleveland's trying to create that culture, right? How do we become a dynasty franchise similar to the, you know, the Patriots or other, you know, Baltimore, I think it has had a good run. Um, and they still are, but how do you, 
you know, how do you create that culture? I think it takes time, right? And I think it's finding, I, I mentioned it in, a, in an interview just the other day, it's finding that key, whether it's the quarterback or whoever, Joe Flacco, when he came in, right, that, that changed the franchise completely just by bringing one guy in and changing the culture. So I think AB's still trying to develop that, even with Stefanski, um, and, and find that, that key. I think they're all trying to find what that is. I feel like we spend a lot of time telling our listeners and anybody who will listen that Cleveland is, they're turning the corner. They might not have reached the end goal yet, but where we were six, seven, eight, nine years ago, it feels like we're night and day uh, compared to that. Did you kind of, I know you didn't yep. get to be around, but did you get the sense like, okay, they're kind of trending in the right direction. Like I can kind of see where this is headed. Yeah. Well, when I was there in 2020, I think it's been the best season that, Cleveland's had in a while we made a pretty good playoff run and you know I I know there's some differing fan opinions on on Baker um but when I was there with with him I mean he he was not only from a a cockiness or confidence uh you know I played against him in college too when I was at Kansas State he was at Oklahoma (laughs) and then and then a funny story with Baker before I go on about him is when I first got signed by Cleveland when I was with the Raiders I had a game in winter against Cleveland and that was Baker's first career start in the National Football League <laughs> and so when I walked in the doors like the first person to come up and he's like hey I just want you to know I remember that you beat me on my first career start. <laughs> so, so that was a, a funny thing with him but um, I really enjoyed being around him um, because I got to see a, a leadership side of him as opposed to me being an opponent in college and so I think he was um, kind of the glue of our team in, in 2020 and it ultimately led us to, you know, down the playoff stretch. Uh, you know, granted, we had a lot of other talent on that team. Um, but for me, you know, being inside the locker room, I I attribute a lot of that success to him. And, and I think he did a really good job for us. I think we've all, we're all big Deshaun fans, but we've also given Baker a lot of credit in being a part of the, the yeah. culture change in Cleveland and like kind of being yep. probably mm-hmm. the only quarterback in that draft that could have survived four years. Uh into the turmoil he came into. So we've given him a lot of credit in being the guy to help kind of transition us into the, hopefully the next phase of what our yeah. franchise is. And, and that's exactly right. It's, it's transitional, right? I mean, we had a good run in 2020. Um, and then, you know, AB made the, the move to decide to bring Deshaun in. Um, and then now what, where is that transition headed? And I think I, I have full faith in AB and in the ownership and Stefanski because, um, they, they know how to groom or how to create that culture. And, and when I was there in 2020, I got to see it firsthand and, and we made a good run. This episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Browns fans, nothing says summer is on its way like the taste of a juicy, tender burger that is grilled to perfection. And nobody does burger perfection like Omaha Steaks. And right now, when you guys go to omahasteaks.com slash dogs, you can order the limited time Burger Perfection Flight. This is one of my favorite deals from last year that they did, and I'm so glad they're doing it again. You guys get 24 mouthwatering steak burgers, not just regular burgers, freaking steak burgers. The pure ground filet mignon burgers, the New York strip burgers, the ribeye burgers, the brisket burgers, the sirloin burgers, and the all new porterhouse burgers. And you get all of that for just $89.99 when you use our code DAWGS DOGS when you check out. Each six ounce burger is filled with flavor from the mild and tender filet mignon to the rich and buttery ribeye. The quality and deliciousness of these burgers can only come from Omaha Steaks and they are guaranteed to satisfy. And guys, at $3.75 a patty, you really can't beat that with the price of food right now. And the price of meat in the grocery stores is absolutely ridiculous. You cannot beat this deal. 90 bucks, 89.99 for 24 of these phenomenal, delicious, awesome steak burgers. And you get all of that when you use code DOGS at checkout. Go to omahasteaks.com, order the Burger Perfection Flight today, and do not forget to use that promo code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, when you check out to get everything. The 24 delicious burgers. Hurry, because these supplies are limited. Take advantage of this opportunity now before supplies run out. OmahaSteaks.com slash dogs, promo code dogs. Craig is usually a fan of water cooler talk, but it's draft season, and that's all anyone wants to talk about. The Athletic has loads of articles about this year's draft, but Greg doesn't have The Athletic, so now he's filling up his water bottle in the bathroom sink. 
which, to remind you, is the sink people use after they use the bathroom. Get the athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. So you brought up that uh, that Browns Raiders game, the OT game. I, I wanted to ask you about that because that's kind of for Browns fans. We we can we don't like to talk about the win part for the Raiders. We talk about you know, man, that was Nick Chubb's kind of coming out party. He had like three carries yeah, for right. 120 yards. Right. But like, I wanted to ask you, like, what's that moment like? You know, you're you're trying to you know stay on a roster. You're going out in an OT game. You know, game winning situation. Like, are you are you yeah, ice cold? Are you are you absolutely a nervous wreck? Like, what's that moment like? You know, whenever whenever I was in college, uh, we played Auburn, and, and they brought me in as ESPN College Game Day, big game in in college, and and I wasn't the starting kicker at the time, and and they brought me in, uh, I think third or fourth quarter, and I had hyped it up so much. My you know, friends and family are watching. It's College Game Day, Kirk Herb Street, and that I can genuinely say, like, I have never been nervous for a game since. And so I kind of took that, um, you know, experience and learned from it and was like, hey, like, let's just go out and do our job and be confident at it and know that we're going to put the ball between the uprights and don't think about the consequences of me sitting. Don't think about, uh, you know, the situation you're in. And ever since then, uh, like I said, I, I haven't really been nervous. I've been a little anxious and excited to play in big games, but but never, you know, what if I miss kind of kind of deal. And so whatever that first that was my first NFL game was uh was Cleveland versus Oakland they bought they brought me in uh Mike Nugent um went on IR and I asked Mike I said hey like what's the key to kicking off the dirt in Oakland you know like what do I need to do and he said well first of all you need to go out there and kick on it and so we did we made a special <laughs> trip we made a special trip out to uh Oakland from Alameda to Oakland and went and kicked on the dirt and and I struggled man I mean it, it's uh you know imagine kicking off a clay infield it's like kicking off concrete you know the ball ends up, end up to to draw more than if you're kicking and planting off of off a of grass or turf and so yeah both of my misses were pulls I I drew the ball and missed it wide left um thankfully I got a few chances and, and got to come back and hit a game winner in overtime but such a cool experience you know for me as a kid you know coming from central texas being five foot nine 160 pounds i would have never thought that that i'd play in the national football league and so to come in as my first game and have a game winner uh was pretty neat i can't even imagine the experience and a cool name you just threw out mike nugent for a lot of us browns fans I, I don't have, I'll admittedly say this, I don't have like a ton of favorite kickers, uh, but Mike Nug Mike Nugent is, he's like up there in the upper echelon of some of my favorite Buckeyes players. So to hear you just like casually throw out Mike Nugent, I'm yeah. very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was back in, uh, you know, 2018. And so it, it's been a couple of years since then. But the good thing with my profession is if you can do it long enough and do it successfully, you know, you'll have a good career. And so that's for me that's why i haven't kind of hung it up yet is because i continue and, and we can you know lead into the ufl if you want to after this oh, but sure. that's why i continue to do what i do is because i'm still competitive at it you know whenever i get to the point to where i'm you know being beat out at competitions or camps or you know then it might be time to say okay i can't do this anymore but you know yeah phil dawson kicked i think what in deep into his into his 30s yeah. Um, and had a, had a good career. So it's, it's definitely possible, uh, you know? Yeah. And I mean like the, in terms of kickers, you're still very young, right? I mean, you're, you're yeah. not even 30, yeah. are you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. 20, yeah. 29. Yeah. So you've definitely got plenty of, plenty of years ahead. Oh, for sure. Yep. And you look to kind of transition to the UFL, like you said, I, I very kind of intrigued by the league i think it's a really cool idea i really like that the xfl and the, I think it was the usfl right they, mm -hmm. they kind of merged this <laughs> one can you just i guess i had it like describe the vibe does it does it have an nfl feel how is it approached and do you get the sense like this thing has some staying power like there's some big names behind it yeah uh, absolutely now there's definitely a budget right they're trying to be on, on budget this year versus you know last year's uh xfl league and so yeah. um you know, to, to compare it to a, an NFL experience, it's it, it's night and day difference. But the the competitions there, you look at names that are in the UFL, it's guys that are just like me that are outside looking in that have, have played on NFL rosters. And so that's one thing that you know I try to tell my friends back home and, and people that that haven't been watching the UFL is like, 
listen, there's there's a lot of talent here, very similar to the National Football League, and you're getting that sort of play on Saturday, Sunday in spring football. Mm. Um, it's just not they're not on the roster. They're you know outside of that that you know 52 man squad or 53 man squad. So um, I think that's something the that message that that the UFL needs to get across is like we've got the talent. It's just you know can they put the product in the field, and I think we're proving to do that. Well, I know just, I mean, Cleveland has experienced this with, with this, but we had PJ Walker on our team just last year yep. and he came in and won two big games for us, one against the the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, and he kind of made his name uh, playing in a spring lead league, which got yep. him onto the Panthers. And now, I mean, he's an NFL guy who, who went there, showed out in that league, and now he gets, he's on rosters in the NFL. So I think you guys yep. have a ton of talent in the league. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes and I hope it sticks around for a long time. Yeah. I mean, that, that tells you how difficult it is to stay in the national football league once you get in. I mean, you know, fortunately for me in my position, you can kick for a long time, but you look at the, the, you know, average service in the NFL is, you know, three to four years Mm -hmm. max. You know, if you're lucky, you get that second contract, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a league of opportunity is, is what they're, they're preaching down here. And for me, when I came out of college, you know, uh, obviously went to the Cardinals and kind of was in and out. And I said, you know, do my agent had asked if I wanted to play in the CFL. And I was always kind of like, I'm an NFL or bust. You know, <laughs> I, I really don't have any desire to, to, to kick in some of these sub leagues. Like I'd, I'd rather move on with my life and do other things. And so fortunately I got some other NFL calls and opportunities that kept me from hanging it up. And then when I played in the first XFL, I had a, a great season until COVID hit. Um, had a, a couple 50 pluses and did well and then got the call by Cleveland stayed in contact with pre you know coach prefer and got to Cleveland and then you talk about the second XFL which was last season had another great year and then got me into Baltimore's mini camp and then got me a workout with the with the Patriots late in the season so it's creating more opportunities for me and as long as it does that uh, I'm going to continue continue kicking I think the the best thing for players is to keep, keep putting things on tape and if you can put good tape out there, you got to hope somebody will find it. And um, I yep, guess right. so. I I think it's a really it's a really cool league for you guys. I'm excited for you guys to be able to have something like this. Uh, we wanted to talk about the the hybrid kickoff. You guys did it in the XFL last year. How do you think? How different was it for you compared to everything you've done in your career? How do you think it's going to affect the NFL? Yeah. So we we did that kick in the first xfl which was in 20 what would that have been 2019 yeah so we did the same same kickoff in 2019 so i was used to it going into uh the uh last season's xfl and so whenever the league the nfl made the move to adopt this kickoff i was i was shocked honestly i, I did not see it coming um and i i think the the fans and players didn't see it coming either um but they preach, you know, they continue to preach health and player safety. And I really firmly believe that the NFL cares and, and believes about, about that because you do see the effects of CTE and player injuries and, and the tenure uh, of NFL players. Um, and you see, you know, the consequences of playing the game of football that we love. And as fans, sometimes you don't see that. Um, and so I do believe that it that it is for player health and safety. But at the same time, they also want to generate returns. I think the kickoff has evolved to... Um, it had evolved to up until the point of this new rule of as basically a pointless play, you know, kick it out of the back of the end zone, hit a touchback, you know, go, go to the restroom, get your snack break or whatever you need to do because, you know, Patrick Mahomes is going to run up on the 20 yard line at during, you know, the CVS commercial break and, and start the drive. Like the, it, it eliminated the, the returners. It, it eliminated the Devin Esters and of the world because kickers just, you know, we're hitting it out of the back of the end zone. So I'm all for it, man. I think it's great. I think you're going to see a lot more points scored um, because of field position. And um, you'll see a lot more electric returns because of this new rule. So I think it's a win-win for both. I think it's it's a win for player health and safety. And then uh, it makes the kickoff more interesting. Yeah, that's what we've been telling people to, you know, on the show is this is an exciting time for NFL because the kickoff, like you said, I mean, it was essentially being – Done, done away with yeah. so yeah to, to yeah. make it yeah. an actual play not just to keep the kickoff in the game but to make it a play where there's scheming and blocking and different plays That's you right. can run and the you know the defense can do different they might drop people i don't know how it all works but i'm excited to see it on the field i think it's going to be a lot of fun 
I, I said, yeah, yeah. I think you could change up the way you build a roster in terms of some of like your, your fringe guys where you, maybe you wouldn't have kept a guy if 95% of the kicks go out of the back of the end zone. But if this guy's a great return guy, you might now you might have to make a hard decision because he could be a weapon because he's going to get to touch the ball three or four times in a game as opposed to, to not touching it at all the whole game. So I think it adds a lot of extra strategy in terms of roster building and all kinds of stuff to the game that maybe some people haven't thought about. Yeah, that's right. And and I think you'll see coordinators get very creative, um, you know, as far as, like you mentioned, scheming. But the return game has, you know, in college, we got to take advantage of it a little bit. Um, you know, when I was at Kansas State, where our special teams and with Tyler Lockett, we we were phenomenal at the return game. And so, you know, when you transition to the National Football League, teams said, oh, we don't want to kick it to Tyler Lockett. We don't want to kick it to some of these big name returners. Just hit it out the back. It eliminated the the fun out of it, so I, I look forward to it, man. I there's all kinds of different um, kinks that we worked out, you know, in the first XFL and then now this XFL um, that I think the NFL won't have to worry about because we we solved some of those problems early on. It's awesome. So um, I was scouring the internet, uh, <laughs> doing research for you, man. I'm on YouTube and I find this video in Texas, seventy yard field goal, and so I, <laughs> I watch it. <laughs> And I'm like, holy shit, oh, I gotta, we got to bring this up. So I guess the question, I mean, you cleared by a lot. So uh, the question I wanted to ask you is um, what's the longest you've made like in practice? Like, you know, like what's what's the, the all time for you, man? I mean, full snap operation, um, you know, even in the UFL, uh, we worked back to, I think it was like 64 the other day. Yep. Um, but for me, you know, how often and people ask that all the time, yeah. you know, what do you think your longest kick is? How strong is your leg? And I've always not really cared about it because the the money kicks, as we call it, you know, the money spot is that 40 to 45 range. For right. kickers. Mm-hmm. And so if you can be consistent at that range, who cares if you're a Justin Tucker that can hit a 64 yarder? You know, at the end yeah. of the day, if it comes down to a playoff game and you miss a 38 yard field goal, the big leg doesn't matter. So. <laughs> I've always been focused on consistency in, in the short range kicks, but yeah, that seventy yard field goal was fun to do. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we had to we had to hit it a couple of times to do that. But you know, uh, you mentioned a long kick. Whenever I was with Baltimore in minicamp, this kind of changed my perspective completely of of, kick, of how to kick a football and how frequently is. You know, I had been with with these NFL veterans, like I mentioned, Mike Nugent, uh, Phil Dawson, uh, Chris Boswell. I spent time with him in Pittsburgh. Um, Jake Elliott in Philly and I got to watch them and how they, you know, went through their warm up and their entire routine. And this last season when I was in Baltimore with Justin Tucker, it, it, he's just a, a different, different animal. I mean, he <laughs> he probably kicks, you know, sixty to seventy balls a day when the average kicker might hit, you know, thirty, forty, fifty balls. And um, you know, Sam Cook, who's the assi- one of the assistant uh, special teams coaches now, who was the holder for Tucker. You know, we were backing up in pre-practice in minicamp, and I think I got back to like 64, 65, you know, a, a slight breeze. And Tucker just keeps going. And I remember looking over my shoulder like, when is this dude going to stop? <laughs> and so I asked I asked Sam, and I said, Sam, is this normal or is he showing off? Like, is he, you know, showing off in front of the new kid that came in? And Sam was like, no, this is normal. Watch him. So Tuck went back. I think it was like, 78 or 80 yards or something with like not even a breeze and the dude is four stepping it and you know hitting it halfway up the pipes like i it's just mind-boggling <laughs> what, what that what that guy can do so yeah when you try to compare another kicker to justin tucker it's just yeah not possible <laughs> don't even try <laughs> yeah we uh we're obviously not ravens fans but i don't think there's any I think he's going to go down as the best ever if he's yeah. not already considered that. I mean, Vin- Vinatieri's got the big kicks, but um, yeah. yeah, Justin Tucker, like you, you got to see it firsthand. He's a he's a freak. Yeah, if he can stay healthy, you know that's the thing is you know when you put that much strain and stress on your body, but you know then again he's he's in in you know perfect shape. So yeah, I would imagine he's going to have a, a a very long career doing what he does. Uh, so I we kind of had I kind of had a, uh, a I guess this is maybe a we'll call it silly question. I don't know how involved he is, but you've been in the XFL a couple times now. Have you ever met the rock? <laughs> uh, no, I have not. Okay. Have not. We did have a, we did have a meet and greet last season uh, where he kind of came in with some of the owners and, and talked on stage. Um, 
but the size of that man is is <laughs> is unbelievable compared to you know a guy like me so yeah that was cool to see him and i'd never seen him in person before and so to see him in person compared to that you know normal even large football players that are playing in the ufl he just towers over him. He's, but he's a lot of fun and he's given us the opportunity to continue playing the sport that we love and, and i'm super grateful for that yeah i was just curious because like a uh i'm a, i'm a, i like the rock but everything he does is very like intense and so i was just like <laughs> did he just like come up to you and be like kick that ball man like i don't know i was just curious. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, he's he's definitely an actor. You know, he knows which way to pose and which way to <laughs> look and, and act. And so that was, you know, you can definitely tell that he was putting on a show. But, he seems um, like a, yeah, he like, I, like I said, it's cool being around him. Just just uh, at least getting to know him a little bit from a distance. Nice. Uh, so, like I, I mentioned before we came on, we have what's, what we call the dog pack. They're, they are the, the Patreon members for our show. We wanted to give them an opportunity uh, to see if there's anything they wanted to ask you. So a couple of these next couple of questions come from those guys. Um, I don't know how much you've seen talk about new stadiums in, in Cleveland, if they want to build a new one, fix up the old one. You kind of already touched about it a little bit. If you're in Cleveland, uh, are you pro-dome or are you pro-open air? I, I feel like I know which <laughs> I way you're going to go. <laughs> I, I watched your show, you know, before, so I got to see what your guys' opinion was. Um <laughs> And so I prepared for this, but I, I'm absolutely, if I, now for a fan atmosphere and for um, a competitive competitive aspect, it, Cleveland needs to be playing football outside. Oh, and so oh. we'll edit I, that out. I, no, I know, I'm just joking. I, know, I, know. <laughs> I, I saw your show um, and y'all were dogging on people were saying, well, that's not football day of C North. And I'm like, dang, that, that's me, man. That's my opinion. I think, I, I think that's what, uh, you know, made Bill Dawson so good is he was able to be competitive in that environment. Um, you know, now me selfishly as a kicker, like, yeah, of course, I would love to play in a dome. If Cleveland had a dome, that'd be another team that, hey, I'll let's put on my list to say <laughs> I can I can be successful in, in that atmosphere. But, you know, you talk Buffalo, you, you talk about Baltimore, Philly, you know, all those teams kind of in the Northeast in Cleveland be, being one of them, uh, you know, playing on the lake, snow coming down. Like, that's how I see Cleveland Brown football. Playing in a dome, like, you know, the Detroit Lions. Man, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> so, Sign me up for easy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's see. This next question says, uh, what sport do you follow outside of football? Like, what's your... I guess let's do this. What's your favorite sport to watch outside of football? And then what's your favorite sport to play? Yeah. Um, to play or, or watch, um, man, I love golf. I, it's, it's very similar. It's very similar to what I do. Um, we talked about it a little bit before the show, but the mental aspect as well and watching full swing and getting to see behind the scenes of what those guys go through the ins and the outs of injuries and, uh, qualifying events and things like that. Like that's, that's what I do on a daily basis. It, it hit me completely. And so, um, I love playing. I love going out. It's, it's kind of a form of yoga for me. I get a focus on the one swing at a time, the, the, the four foot putts that I miss by, which is an equivalent <laughs> to, you know, a, a 35 or a 33 yard extra point. So, right. <laughs> you know, uh, that's what I love doing, man. I, I love playing golf. Um, I just took my, I have a two year old son, um, and I took uh, him and my wife out to the Phoenix Open, which I found out on Reddit that was like one of the top three things not to do in the world is to take your wife and yeah. kid to the Phoenix Open. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we had a great time, man. We we had a good time. Took him out, and he was playing in the mud. And I'm, I'm sure you guys saw all of that. But um, yeah, that's that's my sport outside of football. What? Uh, who's your favorite golfer? Um. My favorite golfer, uh, so I played with him in, in the, uh, uh, when I was with the Raiders, I got to play in the Shriners Open Pro-Am out in Las Vegas, um, and they had invited me to play out in that, so I got to play with Charlie Hoffman, Okay, and so I got I got to know him, you know, turn around of, of 18 holes, not very long, um, but him and I stayed in contact since, uh, you know, 2018 or 2019, whenever that was, Um and so to see his career, you know, with the ups and downs and the success, you know, we went out to, as I mentioned, the Phoenix Open and, and uh, you know, he got us tickets and got my family tickets and stuff like that. And I'm like, 
man, let's have a kicker mentality and let's do this thing. You know, <laughs> let's, let's really, you're capable of competing again. And did I have an influence on him? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> but I think he ended up, he, he ended up going to a playoff hole and finishing safe. So, uh, you know, Charlie Hoffman, if you watch this, man, I feel like I was responsible for, for some of that. I like to think he does. Yep. I like to think he's probably a huge listener. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'll tag him in it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Can listen on. yeah. This episode is brought to you by Danger Coffee. Browns fans, we talk about how Danger Coffee is made free from mold toxins that are in 45% of the world's coffee, but that's not all that Danger Coffee has to offer. Mineral and nutrient deficiencies are a big deal. They make you feel sick, tired, stressed, and they can give you brain fog. These deficiencies negatively affect your immune system, your digestion, sleep, metabolism. Have you ever wondered why you get an initial burst from your coffee, but then you get that little crash not long after? Danger Coffee's patent-pending process remineralizes your body with more than 50 trace minerals and electrolytes, leaving you more energized, engaged, powerful. These micronutrients enter the cells to boost performance. They bind to toxins to provide detoxification support. I know that sounds like a lot, but the bottom line, guys, is minerals matter. And most of us really don't get enough of them on a daily basis. Danger Coffee delivers micronutrients, plus it gives you access to the minerals you already have. Head to DangerCoffee.com, use our code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, for 10% off your order. And that code can be used over and over, so you get 10% off every order you make using code DOGS. It's time to start every day off with a cup of coffee that gets you going and actually keeps you going. DangerCoffee.com, code DOGS. Before we move on, Ohio, Bet365 is offering new users $150 in bonus bets this month. To receive your bonus bets, all you have to do is sign up for Bet365 using our link, make a first deposit of $10, and place a $5 wager on any game. Once that first $5 bet settles, you will receive $150 in bonus bets, even if you lose the bet. To be eligible for this sign-up bonus, you must sign up through our link down in the description. So if you haven't yet signed up for Bet365, click our link in the description and place that first bet. This offer is only available for new customers who are 21 and older and physically present in Ohio. Please gamble responsibly. If you or a loved one has a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Check the episode description for the full terms to see if you can qualify. So during your time in Cleveland, um, did you have a favorite favorite spot to hang out or eat while you were here? I know it was COVID, but if there's anything open. Yeah, let me think about that. Um... When I was in Cleveland, I'd have to look it up. Dang it. I wish I would have known you were going to ask that question because there were a few spots uh, in Cleveland that I did like. Um, but because of COVID, the team was very reluctant to kind of give us freedom outside of the facility, uh, yeah. um, especially for me as a practice squad player. Um, you know, they I wasn't around. Uh, I was around the players, but with the social distancing, we had little uh, monitors that would blink red and and green and tell us whenever we were close contact. So I stayed away from a lot of people and I was pretty scared to kind of go, go into the city. So we spent a lot of time at, at uh, Cuyahoga Valley national park. Uh, My wife and I, I think we went almost every day with the, with the dog and uh, spent a lot of time and enjoying um, that side of, of the Cleveland, you know, Berea area. Um, and we traveled all over, up and down the lake, um, all sorts of uh, small towns in Ohio. We visited kind of the very northeast port uh, of Ohio and just got to know the people, Midwestern, you know, people. And um, I loved it, man. I loved every bit of it. I, If I could, if AB if wants to bring me back, <laughs> I'd, I'd come back in a RV because we, we loved it, man. Yep. We, it's a good spot. It's a good place to raise kids and um, just all around good people. Yeah, yeah. I don't, it's people that aren't from here, I don't think really realize how awesome like northeast ohio is a really great place to to live raise a family like you said it's just a really it's a pretty place it's it's cool i've always enjoyed being here yeah if we can get uh ab get you back there's a good chance you'll be playing in a dome <laughs> <laughs> so what's the decision what's the verdict i heard they bought some land you know i haven't yeah. kept up too much but um what's the what's the status on that so i think both sides are playing a little bit of hardball the 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 browns have purchased land in Brook Park that I think they're kind of trying to use to leverage against the city about like, hey, we could go here if we wanted. The city is trying to enact the um, the Modell law saying that they, they can't move without offering to sell the team or something to somebody local. So I think it's just a lot of politicking right now. Um, 
I get the sense they're going to build a new stadium, but I don't know if anybody really knows yet what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I did enjoy first energy, but the wind there was brutal. Yeah, I mean, you guys tough. know, I, I was, I was fortunately, I was, when I was on practice squad, I was up in a nice warm box. Uh, <laughs> funny story to that too, is my wife came up to a game and of course it was raining and snowing, you know, at that point in the season. And so she was out with the player family tickets out, you know, in the, in the elements. And I'm up in a nice warm box with food and drink and the rest of the practice squad player. And so she had, you know, I don't know, some inexpensive jacket and she froze her tail off. And I think the very next day, um, we went to the Canada goose store and I bought her a Canada goose jacket. I was like, okay, if you're going to come to these games, like I'm going to set you up for success. And so she did. She had, yeah. So she had a good time with that, but I, I get it, man. I, I get it for what's the, uh, what's the going back to the stadium. I know you already asked that question, but I think it's, it's important for, for Cleveland. I mean, what is your, your stance? I watched the episode a little bit before, but what do you guys think? I mean, what are the fans wanting? It depends on who you talk to. Like I'm a season ticket holder and I'm telling, I've been doing it for, I think we're going on five years. My wife doesn't go to a game after like week six. Like, I'm just like, hey, yeah. who want like, I, and then I can't get anybody to go. So it's me and my mom. We're diehard. We go up every week. Right. But, like, it depends on who you ask. I don't, it'd be nice to, like, not be frozen or soaked. But I, either way, like, I don't <laughs> care. That was, like, the ultimate uh, bucket list thing was to get to go to Browns games like that. So either way, it's yep. fine. For, for me, it's not, I, I'm, I'm very pro-dome. I, lo- I like the idea of the dome. Uh, but to me, the bigger issue is location and, um, being able to get there. It's getting into Cleveland on game day. You have to, you have to be in Cleveland six hours before the game starts. Cause they start shutting roads down. You park quarter mile, half a mile away. Like it's just, if they could yep. redo the, the shorefront and make it accessible and I can get into the game in a normal amount of time and get it out and it's nice. <laughs> Sure, I maybe missed the idea of the dome, but I could get behind that at least. It's it's the cold, the rain, and the fact that I have to be there six, seven hours early to even get into the game on time. All those things are like they have me going. Let's go become the the Brook Park Browns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah. that's kind it's of where definitely I hard. It's hard for me to to have an you know a, a differing opinion than that because I did have you mentioned the traffic. I'm like you know well, I got to fly fly by everybody with my player parking pass and go park right next to the stadium and walk, you know, a, a <laughs> 10 step block and go right in. And so, you know, that I don't have that experience, but I do think, you know, for, from a competitive side, you guys, you guys hit the nail on the head, you know, our teams wanting or our fans or, or even management, I think management understands that, but our teams wanting their quarterback to throw for 300 yards, you know, while being a Cleveland Brown, but at the same time, you know, I, I I think there's a lot to unpack there. It depends what you what you want. You know, yeah. do you do you want that that quarterback that can perform, or do you want you know the quarterback that can perform in the elements and get a win? Yeah, you we know? I, I, we use week one of this past season all the time as the example because we went up to the game. We were all there. You know, it's Browns Bengals season opener at home. I mean, the Bengals are coming in. Everybody's got them hyped up like AFC. You know, contenders and all this stuff. And we whooped them 24 to three in a game that it rained the entire game. And afterward, you know, looking back now, people will say, you know, all the, the defense played great. The offense sucked. Deshaun Watson wasn't very good. And if, if you go back and think about that game, it's like it rained the whole time. And he, right, he had right. two, 200 yards and two touchdowns. Like that's yeah. in the rain. That's pretty good. Especially when you're up that big, right. and you don't need to throw, you know, we're running the ball a lot. Yeah. And came out with a win. Exactly. Yes. It, that's the biggest yeah. stat. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that was another thing that uh, the consistent thing that I saw between teams in the NFL is that winning in the National Football League is very very hard, especially on on a game to game basis because the talent is is I mean it's the pinnacle of our sport. Yep. And you're talking about you know these five star recruits from high school making it, and then them not even making the Division One team, and you know and so I think. When you get to the National Football League, winning games is very difficult. And that's the one thing that I saw across teams is that who cares what the stats were? Who cares about all those things? Fans can be critical of that. I totally get it. But the coaches are like, 
at the end of the day, a win's a win. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and and however we need to do that to make it possible, that's what we're going to do. So, which kind you, of a different just, aspect. I would say just you saying that though makes me even appreciate this past season even more because we had all the injuries. We had five different starting quarterbacks through the season. It was we had every excuse to not win games and yet we still won 11 probably could have won 12 if we'd have played starters at the end of the season and made the playoffs which it just it still is like it blows my mind and and i'm happy to hear you kind of give some insight in terms of like what the coaches are saying about stats and how players feel about it because when we first started this podcast there was no doubt I was the fanatic that was like, we didn't win the right way. We should have won by 30 and we only won by 29. We suck, you know? And then yeah. the, the more I do the podcast, the more like we get to, we've met a couple of players, meeting guys like you who kind of give us insights into what it's actually like to be a professional athlete. The more you realize like, it's hard. Just being consistent is hard because the other guys are professionals too. So it's not about, window dressing and looking good when you're it's just about getting the win and surviving to the next week and and staying healthy and doing all those things so i think a lot of guys who were like me four years ago it's it's hard to wrap their mind around the fact like this is hard and just getting wins is is tough well and i think that that can kind of tie into my experience with phil dawson um you know whenever i was with phil and coming out of college too you always wanted to hit what we would call an A ball, right? An A plus or a B ball where it was a perfect end over end rotator. It was a high kick. It was right down the middle. And that's what us as kickers strive for, you know, of course, to be consistent. And so when I got to Arizona, um, that's what I tried to do. I tried to outkick Phil by hitting that A ball every single time. And I'm sitting here competing against Phil and I'm watching his ball that, you know, he, he would hit a good one that would be perfect end over end. He'd hit maybe an X ball or but the guy never missed <laughs> like ever. <laughs> I mean, I'd never been around a kicker that I was competing with where I was like, I don't think I have an opportunity to win this job because he just, <laughs> he doesn't miss. We would even, we went out uh, during training camp. We went to, uh, uh, up to Glendale to the stadium and we were kicking on skinny posts. I mean, they were skinnier than skinny. They were like arena posts and still had, I think four team reps or something and didn't miss. I think I went like three, for four or something or, and I just was like, how is this guy doing it? Well, he's been kicking in the league for 15 years. That's why he does it, you know? <laughs> yep. And so that was a, that kind of ties into that performance side. As Phil had told me, he's like, if you want to play along in this league, who cares what your ball flight looks like? Just make the damn kick. And that's, you know, it's easier said than done, of course. But mm-hmm. that, that was some advice that, that he had, had given to me. Yep. I, I think that's a uh, that's good advice, and that's good for the fans to hear. Yep. To the people who listen to the show, who can be up in our comment section, just go losing their mind because we didn't win by two scores against the team that had a worse record. And it's like, guys, we won. We won a national football yeah. league game. So uh, I think that's that's, right. that's awesome to hear from you. I love getting insight. Getting a chance to talk to players is is so cool to kind of just see what it's like inside the locker room and that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate that. Um, I appreciate you being on here, man. I, I didn't know how long we were going to go. And I feel like I go like another two hours, but I don't want to take up your whole night. So <laughs> Dude, I, I'm, I'm an open, I'm an open book, man. I had a podcast uh, the other night that I thought was going to go like 15 minutes and we went an hour 45. So, <laughs> just, you know, I, I, if y'all want to continue out, I'm an open book, man. I'd, I'd love to, uh, to help out, uh, you know, on, on some opinions, even of the, the new kickoff rule. Um, you know, actually, this would actually be relevant to you guys that I spoke about. Um, and I think maybe teams would find this interesting or fans would, if you don't mind me, or now, now that the NFL kick off. Um, so if you look back at last year, our XFL tape, the first, maybe four games of the year, we were getting beat up. Um, I think Adam Schefter posted one of the videos that, that, uh, the St. Louis team ran a reverse on us and then they took it to the house. Um, and, uh, so for the first four games, we really struggled. And um, it started to have an effect on our game, obviously, with field position and things like that. And so a name that you guys are familiar with, uh, Coach Greg Williams, who oh, was yeah. in Cleveland for, for quite a bit, he stepped in. I remember he came into a meeting, and I knew he was going to do this because I talked to him ahead of time. And he stepped in, and he said, all right, guys, like, forget everything that we're doing. This is how we're going to do it going forward. Um, and um, it's basically my way, and this how, basically we're gonna, that's how we're going to do it. And so from that point on, 
instead of being defensive and kind of catching the returner and blocking and, and staying safe, we started to become way more aggressive. And so uh, Coach Williams had wanted me to kick the ball wide. Uh, and you see me, if you watch the tape, you'd see me kind of flirt with the sideline a little bit in order to pin the returner. Because as you know, in, in this kick, new kickoff rule, the cover unit can't move until the ball is touched. Right. Mm-hmm. And so hang time doesn't matter anymore. It's purely directional. And so Coach Williams wanted me to put it out wide, and that's what I did. So I put it out wide, and I think we were pinning them on like the 15-yard line. I mean, their average start point had to be on average inside the 20. I mean, we were killing it the last half of the season because Greg wanted to be aggressive. And I think that's his, as you guys know, I mean, that's that was his mentality in the NFL was let's be aggressive, let's be attacking, and, and let's make plays. And, and that's what we did. And so I think you'll see maybe a difference between teams in the NFL trying to figure out what works. And hopefully they watch the XFL tape because we it was a night and day transition for us. It went from we're getting our butts whooped on a kickoff unit standpoint to all of a sudden we're making plays and we're making the opposing team drive 85 yards instead of, you know, 60. So it it was a big transition for us to, to figure out. And Greg Williams is, is, is all responsible for that, man. He, he fixed it for us. That doesn't sound like him. Uh, no. My way or the highway. That doesn't sound like the Greg Williams that I, I've, I know. Uh, uh, I wanted to kind of, I was, I was thinking of another question to ask, you know, I was like, man, you, you've played in both of these leagues. I was thinking like, if there was any way you could one thing to change about the NFL, what would it be? And then I started thinking about like, kind of the state of officiating and and we really like some yeah. of the things that the the XFL and other like the UFL are doing with transparency having a, the skybox guy like do you think that's something that the NFL should try to adopt I feel like if they're willing to try this kickoff thing why would they not also look in that direction for for other meaningful changes I agree wholeheartedly I think the fans need to hear they need to it needs to be an open book right as, as far as officiating goes because um you know, now when you talk about like the play calling, I think that that can be a, a hairy subject in the National Football League oh, for because sure. uh, the playbook is, is sacred in the NFL. And so you wouldn't want to give up anything like that, um, you know, on national television, especially if the opponent could be listening in. But as far as officiating goes, you know, whenever they did that back in 2018 with, uh, you know, Mike Pereira and Dean Blandino, we had many meetings with them beforehand. And they said, we're going to be as transparent as possible. We want the fans to hear the discussions with the officials on the field, to to look inside the replay booth. I mean, why is there, why in any reason would that not be transparent, you know? And so I think that would be really cool if the NFL took that over. And I think fans would appreciate that because at the end of the day, we want to get the call right. And I think there's a, sometimes a lot of things that, that aren't called right in the NFL and all of us are scratching our heads. Like it was blatantly, obviously that was past interference. Like why, why can that not be reviewed or overturned? And the XFL has, has found that kind of happy medium, not even happy medium, basically just saying, we're going to expose the officials and we're going to get the call right. And so they do that through replay. They do that through the official up in the box. They do that through Dean Blandino in New York, and they're all watching um, how it goes down. And I think it's been really successful for the XFL and the UFL now. And I think the NFL you know, might look into something like that. I think it'd be really neat. I feel- I was going to say, I hope so, because, you know, we deal a lot, we, we entertain a lot of different audiences. So we do a lot on social media and I hear a lot of fans that are definitely going down the path of being very convinced anymore that some of this stuff is really fixed that some of these, I mean, you know, because, because like you said, some of this stuff is so blatantly obvious. It's like, how could you get that wrong? Your professional referee. And I think that with the, you know, the, rapid growth of sports betting and everything that's going on these days. The NFL needs to be very careful. I just, I'm afraid they're walking a pretty tight line and it's yeah. a sport that I love. It's a league that I love. I mean, we do this podcast. We, we love this sport and I would just hate to see them tip over to that other side of where people no longer really give it validity anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And I, I think it'd be fun for, you know, uh, now, granted, the XFL switched back to kind of the old style kickoff, so we're not doing it anymore. But I do think it would be neat for NFL fans to watch the UFL, and I encourage that to watch that the officiating transparency and try to push that opinion kind of onto the National Football League because I enjoy watching it myself. I mean, we're, I'm watching games on Saturday in the hotel room before our game on Sunday. I'm like, this is perfect. If the officials don't get it right, <laughs> let's let's get it right. I mean, that's that's part of the reason of. of being officials and and, uh, and playing the game of football. So 
yeah, I think it's a great thing that the UFL introduced, and and I'm and I'm glad they did it. Awesome, it's awesome. Man. Well, I want to. Well, we uh, we're coming up on pretty much what we normally do, so we'll wrap this thing up. I want to give you a chance to kind of tell the people, like you said, encourage them. DC Defenders, when are your games? How can they watch all that good stuff? Yeah, so we we play this Saturday uh, against Arlington. Um, I think it's on. Uh, it's either Fox or ESPN. So we do get primetime coverage, which is sweet. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, last week we were playing during the the women's uh, uh, championship game, basketball championship <laughs> game. So I think we lost some viewership there. Um, but it, it's the competition level. We talked about that early on in the show. Is like it's not just guys that you know aren't capable of playing the NFL. Like there's proven veterans that are playing in this league. And it's very competitive. So I think that's that's a fun aspect of it. I enjoy playing in the league because of that and being around teammates that have had three, four, five year careers in the NFL. Like that means something. Um, and so that that's pretty neat. But yeah, we play on primetime television. It's good quality football. It's in the spring. Um, I mean, what else there is to watch on TV on a Saturday, Sunday evening? So I think it's it, it's a cool experience for fans uh, to watch football. Awesome, man. We really, really, really Absolutely. appreciate you being here, giving yes. us so much of your time. This one, I was really excited to do this, and I feel like it eclipsed my expectations. So I'm super pumped. We got to meet you, talk to you. I'm definitely going to be tuning in, watching you, rooting for you. Yes. Um, and, and I just really appreciate you being on here. Maybe we can even have you on again sometime. Thank you so much for Dude, taking I, the time. Absolutely, man. I, I, I've enjoyed watching you guys, even when I was with uh, with Cleveland and, and kind of followed the Browns. Like I've I listen in on, on your guys' stuff. So um, I I definitely uh, appreciate it. And, and anytime you guys want to have me on, man, I'd, I'd love to do it. Awesome. It, awesome, man. You can lie. Are we big in the locker room? A lot of people listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Now, now, players listen, man. I mean, like when Mary Kay says some things, and like players – Players listen, man. So yeah, they, you guys are definitely some talk of the locker room. So, there we go. Uh, dome okay. versus, well, you know, well. the dome versus not dome. You know, I, I think that's a hot topic. So y'all keep on that one. But yeah. I'm gonna push for Cleveland well, Browns playing outside in the snow and in the elements. Like that's what I love about the National Football League. Oh, awesome. Well, we appreciate you pumping up our ego a little bit right there. Again, <laughs> taking time to be here, hanging out with us. We'll definitely have you back on sometime. And uh, good luck for the rest of your season. Everything you do going. forward. Forward. we appreciate you being here yeah thanks guys again we appreciate you guys being here a uh, huge shout out to matt from the dc defenders that was an awesome interview yes uh having him on here getting some insight into not only the mindset of a kicker uh just a, the mindset of an nfl player a professional athlete in general i think he gave us a ton of cool insight into what it means to be a professional athlete and and to be a professional kicker and what can kind of be a a solitary uh, position, you know, it's, it's you're the only one out there kicking, and there's seventy thousand eyes on you. And if you miss it, everybody's gonna hate you. And if you make it, good, that was your one job. Yep. You know what I mean? It's yep. kind of it, for a hand. Other than a handful of guys, kind of throughout the history of the game, it's kind of a thankless job. Uh, so I think you got to be really mentally tough to do it. Uh, Matt's a great guy. Uh, this is our first time meeting him. We can't ha- wait to have him back on the show. So uh, make sure you guys check him out when he plays for the DC Defenders uh, on the weekends. They're on ESPN and uh, in Fox. Uh, So you get primetime games. Go support him. Uh, A lot of good players in these leagues. Support these leagues so we can keep them around. So we appreciate him being here. We appreciate you guys listening, supporting the show. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at The Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com. This episode is sponsored by Aura. Browns fans, your online data and identity are way too precious to be left just hanging out there in the open for these data-stealing thugs to come after it, take it, and sell it to whoever they want. 
Scammers and spammers are just capitalizing on all of your data being sold. And I'm telling you right now, you don't even realize it because I didn't realize it. Head over to Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash dogs, D-A-W-G-S. Get a 14 day free trial. This is what I did. Create your account and then you can run your data check, a free data check, and it will tell you how many data brokers are selling your information on the dark web and in different areas of the internet. And then Aura starts working immediately to remove your information from those places. I kept thinking I was good online. I was fine. I wasn't doing anything crazy with my information. I was being cautious while I was shopping online, all those things. And still, when I ran my check, I had 14 data brokers identified selling my information and or immediately started taking my name and all my information, my address, my email, my phone number, everything out of those places. I am so sick and tired of getting the spam emails, getting the spam text messages, the calls, and it's time to put all that crap to an end. So check out Aura, 14-day free trial, run your checks, see what all the features they have to offer, like their VPN, their parental controls, everything that they have to protect your online identity. Aura.com slash dogs. Take back control of your identity today. (laughs) Philip has just lost the respect of the youth league football team he coaches. He was asked what New England should do in the draft, and his answer was objectively terrible. The Athletic just wrote a great article about this, but Philip doesn't have the Athletic or the respect of a boisterous group of 11-year-olds who once looked up to him. Learn from Philip's error, get the Athletic, and get the info you need to speak draft fluently.